Humanity has a long-standing war our bodies have engaged in quite frequently and will continue to do so into the foreseeable future. What's ironic about this conflict is without it, our bodies tend to degrade and overreact over time, leading to cascading issues of an, like an overactive immune system, which in turn could potentially lead to anaphylaxis, should the theory concerning the matter actually be true. Homo sapiens have spent a lot of time on this rock, and during the course of that, we have come into contact with many species that reside here. In some capacity, this has been great for us as we have learned to dominate our environment, such as with farming techniques and getting animals, or potentially even running off predators through methods of hunting or physical barriers. But there are some forms of animals that have been rather difficult to remove. But through time and technology, we have, for the most part, achieved it. Parasites are abhorred by most of humanity. A freeloader neat living in the basement of your body, gleaning nutrition from you, such as with a tapeworm, destroying red blood cells by consuming the hemoglobin to source specific amino acids within, like with malaria, and in some cases, heading to the brain, which is absolutely terrifying, leading to rapid decompensation and eventually your end, such as with Nagleria fallery. Because of these outcomes, first world countries have long since attempted to eradicate these animals and in turn, first world countries have stepped to the plate and for the most part, we have done it. And you're probably wondering why I'm calling them animals because in specifically this episode, it's going to deal with a parasitic animal. So whenever there is an infection, anti-parasitic medication is given, which typically results in its destruction. The problem is as of late, we have kind of figured out alarmingly we might need parasites. In first world countries, allergies are on the rise despite how clean the environment is, and that might be the literal problem. It is well known certain parasites will release a calming effect on the nervous system as they exist within us, which in turn stops our immune systems from overreacting. In fact, there is an idea that essentially states if we go to other worlds, such as Mars, we will need to take a scoop full of dirt with us to infect ourselves with parasites in subsequent generations so that our immune systems don't like just totally freak out and go out of control. There is truth in it, but the reality is we could probably just develop a medication to do the same thing. I don't want a tapeworm unless it's beach season. <laughs> so anyhow, something to note is parasites are usually smaller, either being like a protozoa, protist, a single celled organism, or there could be a virus or bacteria, or even the size of like an incredibly small worm. They are smaller because they need to be able to enter your body. Others can be larger, but you get the idea. Sometimes there's even people in your life who could be a parasite as well. Not in my life, but maybe in yours. I don't know you. But the question here would be raised, what if you took a parasite and induced genetic changes in it, resulting in a new class of animal that not only still had a taste for your blood and organs as usual, but is now the size of a human torso? I'm glad you asked. How you knew to ask that is beyond me. In the events of larva, the beef industry is tired of dealing with 1,400 pound cows as they would now want like 3,000 pound cows. They develop a feed that while growing the herd has the unintended consequence of genetically altering anything within. So in today's episode, let's take a look at the larva parasite from the movie Larva, its genetic alteration, and discuss how it ultimately develops into a vertebrate. But first, this episode is sponsored by Factor. It's a new year, and if you're ready to leave 2023 behind in the dust like I am, you are facing a future in a brand new way. Why not use that momentum of the new year to correct bad eating habits and get healthier in the process? With Factor, your resolutions will stick with their high-protein meals, keto meals, calorie-smart options, vegan and vegetarian, and many other options, along with 55 ads. I have personally been ordering from Factor for over a year now, having these fresh, never frozen meals on hand that only take like two minutes to heat up and enjoy has stopped me from turning to horrible food like Lord knows how many times. With these meals delivered directly to your door, completely fresh and also still delicious, just pull them out of the fridge when you're ready to eat and before you know it, you have a tasty but more importantly, healthy meal. Personally, because I actually use my earnings to buy Factor, I can tell you it's awesome. Being healthier, bench has gone up like 50 pounds in the last few months, I'm leaning out and going with a high protein option stops me from having to cook like chicken and rice to meal prep so it's saving me like a ton of time. It's really amazing having this service on hand and I would highly recommend it. If you're interested in getting 50% off your first box to try out for yourself you can head to factor75.com or click the link below and use code Roanoke50 to again get 50% off your first factor box. Alright let's get back to it. So first off I have to beat the spoof allegations. This is not a copy of Slither although you may think it rather similar. I mean, it kind of is, but there's no Nathan Fillion, which is pretty tragic. We open up our story to a group of young pre-adults running in a field. They are going cow tipping, a tradition in America for those who are of the uninitiated. You basically just tip over a sleeping cow. The point is really not the cow tipping itself, but going out there with women and having fun, proving that if you can get near a cow, you know, they might like you because 
Uh, if you didn't know, cows will absolutely wreck you because that cow doesn't know you. There is inherent danger with messing with herbivores. So as they discuss the wager, the women agree to do birthday suit lap dances if the young men manage to push over the bull. The bull, of course, being able to gore you and tear apart your spine, rib cage, and any internal organs in about two seconds flat with their large horns. Yes, very good. Totally worth it. But at that age that they are, their prefrontal cortices have not actually developed fully, so it seems like a great trade if you can't actually properly weigh the options. So as they go to push it over, it falls over and does nothing. You know, what usually happens with like a one-ton animal. They quickly realize not only did they win their bet, which is pretty great, uh, the bull is actually no longer alive and was just standing there. As they look down, its internal organs begin pulsating and moving. So that's a little disturbing as they run off to go tell someone, and then a creature bursts from its stomach, indicating, hmm, might not look good for the surrounding mammals of this area, humans included. So we now head over to the Timu version of Dean Winchester. With a love for animals and a hate for burgers, he's a vegetarian. We meet Eli Rudkus. He's the new town company vet who arrived earlier, which surely won't cause any issues with the beef industry whatsoever. As he looks through the previous vet's files, it's a little weird because the other guy just kind of bailed out. It's alleged that he met his untimely end, but it's actually not true. Then he just throws confidential files in the trash rather than reading them. All right, then what a nerd. You know what? Maybe he is like just straight up a Dean Winchester. I don't know. That kind of, Maybe that's what Dean would do. Heading over to a farmer's house, he calls out to him but sees nothing. A man named Jacob appears with a pellet dispenser. And it's kind of odd because Jacob literally called this guy. You know what? That's how I'm going to start answering the door and greeting friends and family as well. A totally normal and measured response, why do you ask? He then goes on to ask where, uh, you know, the old company vet was. Well, turtleneck under a jacket here is the new company vet, and brother, he's making house calls, yeehaw! So they head out and find one of Jacob's cows toppled over near the river, and its guts have spilled out, and they have no idea what could have caused it. They then go to check on the sick cow. About two months ago, she started putting on more weight than normal. Same here, got them gains. 250 on bench. Hell yeah, brother. So as the vet looks at them, he cannot identify the species, which is marginally odd. Eli takes a sample as he's told everyone in the area uses the same feed. Company gives them free feed and all they have to do is sell their cows back to host tender meats company. Jacob then talks about the corporate machine, man. And I mean, it is, I suppose he's not wrong. Or like, just don't accept the feed and sell elsewhere. I don't know, I'm not a cow farmer, so maybe that's not how it works. But also, as always, shout out to farmers. No idea if any of them watch this channel, but without y'all, we are literally starving, so keep up the good work. As a woman rakes near her fence, she looks sketched out by Eli for reasons unknown. But you know, then again, I walked into a bar one time in a small town in the Rocky Mountains on a trip out to Seattle in the middle of nowhere in Montana, and I got the same exact look, so I get it. Eli then heads back to his fully furnished vet office, and or house, I suppose, and or dead man's furniture storage, as he looks at the parasites in the water. He drops one of his samples like a huge nerd and immediately then cuts his finger, dropping some blood, as the parasite just kind of sashays over to it and drinks it, growing rapidly. Eli then spots the parasite and picks it up, seeing as it's a blood-consuming parasite. He calls in an old contact to check out what sort of parasite it is, and he's told, since he almost lost his job before, like, well, I don't know if I can check out what kind of parasite this is. Bro, it's a parasite. Just say you're looking at it. Like, I don't know why his contact was so sketched out. Like, just identify it, you nerd. So first things first, we now see that this is clearly a Helminth parasite. This being the generalized term, because based on what we will see later, it's more refined name would be a platy Helminth or just a flatworm. You wouldn't call them completely cylindrical, but more of a leaf shaped than anything. Originating millions of years ago in their free living forms, there are roughly about 10,000 species of these worms, but the important thing to remember about this specific parasite is they are invertebrates. They are not very common in the US, but they absolutely love your liver, your bile ducts, and your gallbladder, which will explain their hunting style later on. Meanwhile, the sketched out woman from earlier goes to feed her dog, calling out, he's nowhere to be found. So she gives up the food idea and just goes to look for him. Also, the dog's name is Cooter. Why, out of all the names imaginable, would you name a dog Cooter? Anyhow, so she finds her dog torn open. And you know, if you look at it from the side, it actually kind of resembles. My lawyer has informed me I cannot finish that joke. As she screams, she hears something in the woods as she's attacked by an unknown creature, presumably meeting her end. Back over at the vet's office, he literally sends biohazard material through the mail, and I'm like 84% sure you're not supposed to do that. Okay, actually, I looked it up. That was bugging me. You really can. The USPS ships 15 to 20% of all hazmat material sent by any method through the US. Bro, I had no idea. So as we jump over to a fundraiser, Host Tender Meats has created a new feed and says they're going to be the sole supplier of this new class of beef. Usually when people say those things, like a new class of human or a new class of food or a new class of criminal, 
it's never really a good thing. The cows will be larger and stronger than ever before, able to bench 400 pounds and moo 12 times louder. They have slaughtered one of these cows, which remember, you can't spell slaughter without laughter, as the town begins to consume that meat, with parasites in it, of course, so... Which, this is just for your information, uh, it may seem like a little pearl clutching, but most meat has at least some form of parasite in it. That is why fish, for instance, according to the FDA, you have to freeze the fish if you want sushi in the US, as it kills the parasite. That's why eating fresh sushi over in like Japan can expose you to these parasites, which is also why you eat ginger, because it's supposed to kill the parasites. And this is also why it's highly important to cook your meat enough as you kill these parasites that could be housed within. And now, I mean, I eat my steak blue rare, like, cut off its horns, wipe its butt, and walk it past the grill twice, and I'm going to eat steak. So there's always that chance that I'm taking. I'm just relaying the information. Also, that means uh, the parasite's still in there. You're just eating it. The hunter becomes the hunted. So Eli then goes to grab food as he meets a guy named Milo. Milo is surprised that the new vet is up there already. He asks him the standard questions. Who are you? What do you think about the UAP sightings lately? Uh, do you ever get nervous? Can I have a list of your fears? What is your social security number? You know, pretty much the standard questions when meeting people. Milo is head of R&D, as Eli mentions the parasites that he found in the cattle's feces. Also, Eli is a vegetarian, I think I already mentioned this, it has nothing to do with anything, but it will explain why he does not get infected. So now we meet Haley and Fletcher as they talk about stocks and 300% profits, which um, they are doing like pretty well, and this is why they're doing this in the first place also. And they are passing along at least a 12% increased price to the cattle farmers. Basically, this new research that they have done makes cows huge, with way more meat on them, and the feed is what's going to be doing this. Of course, you need to ask yourself two things. First, how is it actually being achieved in the cow itself? And second, what are the secondary effects when it comes to parasites? The second question being somewhat important to keeping the blood and liver in your body. You know, if you're into that sort of thing. It's always important to remember downstream effects when doing anything in an enclosed environment. Like, too many antibiotics given out to everyone's friendly neighborhood chlamydia. Uh, we're almost now on the cusp of not being able to cure that anymore. Wear a rain jacket. You do not want to be patient zero with that when we figure out we can't cure it. Milo then brings Eli over to meet Haley and Fletcher as they realize, oh, he's here early. That's not good. So Milo says Eli is asking the wrong questions already. Eli then makes a pass at Haley as she looks at him as if he's about as necessary as a toothpick in a meth lab. As everyone's sort of like hanging out, we meet this loving family number one. Hopefully nothing bad happens. WTF Richard over here yeets the frisbee into oblivion as his dad goes to grab it. The pond looks mega nasty, probably with you know, all the little slain animals around it. Probably shouldn't touch that water for the simple fact that there's probably a ton of bacteria in there. Flesh eating by the looks of it, under like normal conditions, but falling in, he starts freaking out as the parasites in the water immediately start gravitating towards him. They manage to bring him out of the water somehow not getting overwhelmed by the parasites themselves, and he ain't looking so hot. Eli spots the dead rabbit where the parasites were on it, and at the hospital, Eli asks if the doctor could do some tests to see if the parasites in the creek were in the man as well. Also, this is the worst lighting I've ever seen in a hospital ever. He goes on to check on the man as the nurse then makes some notes and leaves. We then see one of the parasites come out of his nose and go into his mouth as it immediately begins sucking his blood, presumably in his stomach, or at least in the abdominal region. Getting larger and larger, this thing grows exponentially fast. From this, we can tell the parasite is definitely a blood-feeding parasite, which is pretty standard for the fluke worm. That night, Eli makes some notes as he remembers, oh, it's the feed, and then he gets a call, and it's Tom, thank God. The man from earlier who wouldn't run tests to see if it was like a parasite, but he did and so he's finally gotten back to him. He thinks it's either a new species as it's not in the database or it's a mutation of some kind as it's genetically similar to a common liver fluke worm. So now it's time to talk more in depth about this parasite. I mean, this is why we're here to discuss the world's most horrible creatures, right? So the fluke worm predominantly lives within your liver. Untreated infections can persist up to 25 to 30 years as that's the lifespan of this parasite, which is absolutely a wild lifespan considering most animals of that size could not even get close to that length of life. But this parasite induces symptoms of indigestion, abdominal pain, amongst other symptoms like crapping yourself to death. While existing within the liver, as they move about and attach, this can cause issues like liver scarring and fibrosis. Scarring of the liver is never a good thing, as you might imagine, for the simple fact that your liver is there to detox your body. So having a bunch of it scarred, not ideal. Which uh, I have to call out, detox teas are hilarious. There is no detox pill or drink. You literally have an organ that detoxes your body every second of every day. So don't give into that nonsense. Anyways, there's going to be somebody out there who's angry at me in the comments calling me wrong, but just because you crap your brains out after drinking dandelion tea or whatever it is, doesn't mean it's detoxing you. That just means you've upset your stomach. 
So this fluke worm existing in your liver, it has access to a massive blood supply where it will continue to mature. It should also be known that they can latch on the intestinal walls and move through bile ducts and to the gallbladder. They will lay eggs that are then moved to your intestinal system where they will come out as excrement to continue the life cycle and the other eggs and then they infect something and then they live for 25 to 30 years and create their own eggs, a parasitic life cycle. So from here, that's how they kind of go through because animals will just kind of take a dump anywhere and then they'll be like, oh wow, hey, <laughs> This flower that's surrounded by turds, let me eat that. So the human immune system will attempt to launch a countermeasure against the liver fluke worm in several different ways, such as with eosinophils and neutrophils, but the issue is the parasite has an extremely durable outer covering, which makes it resistant to cytotoxic material being released by these immune cells. This instead may damage the cells around the worm, leading to the aforementioned liver issues. The body basically hurts itself in its confusion. Eventually your body, it's not so much that it gives up, but it decreases activity, but a flare up every once in a while is pretty common. The standard treatment is fairly simple. One or two doses of a medication called, and I'm gonna try to say this correctly, triclobendazole. That actually legitimately took me 10 takes. You should be proud. Steroids can be given if it's in the acute phase, but overall, super easy parasite to treat if you have the medications. If not, you gotta spend 25 to 30 years with this thing, potentially doing damage to your organs. And now you know, and knowledge is power. So Eli is on the right path, but he's a little sketched out as he's jumped the gun before, and that got him fired at his last job, or he can no longer practice in North Carolina and Virginia anymore. Okay. So he puts up a town meeting flyer the next day, heading over to said town meeting because things move fast around here. The farmers are all having issues with their cattle. Eli suggests quarantining the cattle as the corporate machine now arrives. He says farmers need to take their cows off the feed, which is a bit awkward and kind of a bit of a bind as he was actually hired by the company to be their vet. He suggests the cow feces are high in nitrates, which is leading to the parasitic activity. Safe assumption, but unfortunately, it goes way deeper than that. Jacob then speaks up about how everyone has problems with their cattle. The tone was starting to shift towards maybe moving away from host tender meat's feed, but at this point, the sheriff tells Jacob, go easy, boy. But like, literally, he sounds like that, and then Jacob's like, yeah, don't call me that. It was like Arthur and John Marston having an argument or something. So yes, this seems like a legal issue, officer. Very good. Your input is definitely noted. Anyhow, Haley gets up and accuses Eli of screwing up before, which is a classic maneuver. You don't attack the argument, you attack the character of the person. Remember, if you ever see this in the wild, that means the person who's making a claim probably has a point, and the person trying to refute it has no counter, so they try to convince you to change your stance by making you distrustful of the person disseminating the information. It is highly manipulative reasoning, but she brings up red tides and how those quietly disappear, and I mean, yes, after many, many deaths of native species, it does finally go away. What's the point here, gal? So now Eli's job is pretty much gone. Jacob goes to say, well, Eli, at least you tried. Fletcher now launches into a discussion about how all the town relies on host tender meats for employment. Without them, the town dies. I mean, possibly. I mean, they could just sell their cows elsewhere, I suppose. We always need more steak. So over at a bar at 12.30 p.m. on a Wednesday, Jacob then calls Eli to tell him, you need to come take a look at my cow, it looks pretty bad. By the time Eli arrives, the cow is already done so. Its guts have spilled out, indicating that there's a continuing issue around here, but something exited its body. Jacob looks around as then they hear skittering, or perhaps even a scuttle or two. Oh, God. The only thing worse than something that scuttles is something that swims. I am, of course, referring to the god-awful, get me off of this planet immediately. I can't believe I have to share a rock with this thing. It's the anglerfish. Legitimately. I need to find a movie where uh, it's nothing but bashing anglerfish, because that's going to be like, I fall asleep to that every night. So Jacob then fires into the roof, making a perfect oval. Yes, that's how pellet dispensers work. As the creature continues crawling around, sneaking up behind them, Jacob skeet shoots the thing as Eli is angry. He's like, I needed it alive. Why? The body is right there. That is evidence enough of something weird going on. It will still have the same genetic profile. Interestingly though, uh, Eli finds it has a vertebral column, which is highly alarming given its size and parasitic nature. So why is having like a spine a problem? I'm glad you asked. This denotes a deep genetic tampering. Fluke worms do not possess even a hint of an internal skeleton. They're a worm. But along with that, and according to the theory of evolution, it took a long time for an actual spinal column to form. The first animals appeared around 574 million years ago, with the vertebrates appearing about 74 million years after that. That might not sound like a lot, but uh, to some, it might. The issue is our brains cannot comprehend numbers that large. So to put it into perspective, modern humans are thought to have become what we are around 300,000 years ago, which it used to be 100,000, but then they found other evidence, eh, who knows. But 
personally, I don't think we know how long we've been around. So of all human history, right? 300,000 years when we became humans, that could be relived 246 times in just the time it took invertebrates to develop a spine. What a bunch of cowards. So once they got done being big babies about it, this led to an explosion of other animals, which eventually led to land dwelling animals and then to us. It's a highly interesting process, but the point is, for this fluke worm to develop a spine out of nowhere, this doesn't just be like, ooh woo, I have a spine now. This internal skeleton denotes <laughs> there's a lot going on. And there's also a lot of interference from what I believe to be another genome. Something else is dictating to the cells to produce structures as it grows. Does this process continue into adulthood or is this really just when they are kind of like a larva that they begin to grow? And we'll kind of go over this when we get to the actual genetic tampering here in a moment, which we'll discuss the implications of it. Later, as Burnett Carrot Top then gets ready for his date, he's shaving his lack of facial hair and I can't talk too much smack. My beard just started coming in at like 28. Prior to that, it was a beard, but not like a beard beard. And oh God, the beard purists have showed up in the comments. He goes on to take a shower as his girlfriend calls him. While talking to him, uh, he starts bleeding out as the creature bursts from his stomach, which would be incredibly painful. I mean, think about it. Everyone feels like they're just gonna straight die whenever their stomach hurts like just a little bit. Now think about it actually tearing. Ouchies. Not to mention uh, the other issues associated. I mean, your stomach has a ton of blood vessels and nerves that are actually existing on the stomach to innervate the smooth muscle so they can actually contract. When that tears, that has a potential to start spilling stomach acid all over your nerves and your intestines. And that's one of the things where you can just not pass out for the pain quick enough. Meanwhile, over at the hospital, the doctor is checking out his scan saying, I've never seen anything like this before. Of course, he doesn't show the camera the scans, which would have been cool to see, but Patrick then wakes up from his coma as they start checking his vitals. Everything is looking good, right up until he's not looking good, and then he flatlines. They go to administer the shock pads in his chest as he quite literally explodes due to the parasite in his abdomen. You know, this is all looking very familiar. I think I've seen this somewhere before, but I can't quite put my finger on it. This takes out some of the doctors and nurses because of like the cart that was right next to him. As the creature jumps onto the wife and starts sucking blood, I'm assuming out of her upper torso or head, the parasite then retreats to the basement of the hospital. So like no need to alert the hospital or anything, just go check it out yourself guys. Jacob being the giga chad that he is though, hands Eli a force multiplier. And first off, there's several problems here. <laughs> Eli is an idiot for two reasons. Uh, first, you don't wave it around in the general direction that a person is walking off on. Like, what are you doing? You're making me uncomfortable. The second is his trigger discipline. It's just horrific. Finger off the trigger. For the love of God. People like this are excluded from the stay strapped, get clapped community. I mean, it's your right as an American roll tide, but at the same time, we're making fun of you and you need to take a class, obviously, and get some proper training because that's not what you do. You're gonna end up bald winning someone. So as they sweep the basement, they don't alert anyone who's down there that there's a, a human eating creature on the loose because why would you? Very good guys. So, I mean, like that janitor or that doctor, they, they don't need to know there's a torso sized parasite running around that can suck your liver through a tube. So Eli then hides as he hears more scuttling Remember what Damon Baird taught us, and not Damon Beard in the last episode. That's, this, this was on me, my bad. <laughs> so he goes to investigate it. Again, horrible trigger discipline as he walks into the woman's bathroom. He opens a stall where a woman is sitting. Why was that door not locked? I also like to live dangerously. They then hear screaming and see the janitor from earlier that Jacob could have definitely warned but didn't has now been dragged off. Way to go, Mr. Hero. So heading to the scary Terry part of the hospital, he finds a janitor and then he opens fire on the parasite. They can hear it in the pipes and begin following it. Over at the autopsy room, I'm not sure what they're called, autopsyist, gets taken out by the parasite as soon as he opens up the door as the gruesome twosome hear the attack. They go to check it out and then find a guy is missing as the parasite jumps onto Jacob, but Eli is able to put a round in it. And he's lucky the round didn't go all the way through. I mean, they do not appear to have all that much meat on them. So later that night at Fletcher's home, they're eating dinner for the evening and I have no idea what this dude is doing. Like you can't hear it, but he's like growling and whatnot. It's really strange. But then he gets a call to save us from that painful interaction of love between a father and son as Fletcher has to go into the office for a minute and he leaves dinner. Finally, the hospital is aware something is going on as Jacob, Eli, and Haley leave the premises. Over at the police station, the sheriff is getting calls about weird things in the woods as he asks the guy straight up, he's like, are you making moonshine again? And the caller's like, of course, but there's still something out there, which made me laugh. The sheriff then starts saying astrology stuff about Mercury being in microwave or something like that. I, I don't know, I wasn't paying attention. And that's gonna piss off uh, some astrology people. <laughs> so uh, Fletcher then calls the sheriff telling him to find the vets and Jacob 
and Haley. I guess it would just be vet, singular. So over at Lover's Lane, bro, I need to become a farmer if all these women are hot and bothered for them. As this guy starts having issues keeping it in, one in four they say, his girlfriend jumps over the seat to try to start the car. This has to be a carburetor issue from like heat soaking because it won't start. And remember, keep your foot on the gas when you want to start a heat soaked carburetor. But because his stomach explodes, uh, she takes off running into the fields without shutting the car door, which would have saved her life, before getting chased down by the parasite and sucked dry. Honestly, I think it was her fault. Always trap the thing in the car. So over at the office, Milo then checks uh, on the beef that he should have been checking a long time ago and spots the meat is like absolutely contaminated with so many parasites. Mm, gross. So Fletcher comes in as Milo calls Patrick. Fletcher informs him that Patrick is gone as Milo says the drug is not only affecting the cows but the parasites as well. No kidding. The proof is in the meat. Fletcher then goes to take a look and sees it's absolutely crawling with parasites. Again, you. He says at this point that they need to destroy the drug in all the research that they had. They can't let this be traced back to them. So what is going on here exactly? As made mention, this feed was actually engineered in a way that was supposed to beef up cows, no pun intended. All the bull aside, like many other systems of the human body, for instance, their growth is dependent upon their genetics. Now, standardly, there is going to be an upward limit and a lower limit based on the individual, but through things like picking a particular partner for a myriad of reasons, you could potentially see favorable traits in an offspring. Cows are under the same rules. Over the course of millennia, dating all the way back to the 9th millennium BC, we domesticated the animal that would become the cow. Through the ensuing years, we have bred cows to be larger, produce more milk, and literally be tastier. That has given us the modern day cow. This was accomplished in the same way that we domesticated dogs. By breeding animals with certain desirable traits, we would then change their behavior and their appearance. And for a time, this was critical for keeping humanity going at that current point in time. But arguably, things may have changed a little bit. There are over 8 billion humans on this planet now. Our techniques of farming are starting to raise concern given how much space we need to do it and how many nutrients are actually left in the soil. Along with that, there's the question if we're raising too many animals. Now, I'm not here to say cow farts are changing the atmosphere, man, because you know what? I'm not a climatologist. I don't know. But our methods with cows might be questionable, leading to issues like mad cow disease outbreaks, which was based on a prion infection. Along with this, the number of cows needed to fuel society, leading to the idea of maybe we should just eat bugs, which I'm not eating bugs. Like an idea needs to be molded into our head of how, how do we fix this? So it's kind of an interesting concept in this movie because what if we could genetically alter the cow and then increase its muscle mass? How would we accomplish this and what would this look like? Well, we could do it through gene editing. Within animals, we all possess the MSTN gene or MEF2B gene, which is a member of the myocyte enhancer factor 2 family. There are other genes associated with hypertrophy, but you get the idea. Now, why hypertrophy or why increase muscle? So what is steak made out of? Muscle. By affecting the actual genes of a cow concerning its muscle growth, you can make a cow larger and pack on more meat to its body. As may mentioned by Jacob, the cows basically doubled in size. Now this growth cannot come out of nowhere, so it's very likely the feed would be incredibly dense concerning its protein composition and nutritive properties to fuel the cow's new muscular growth. And this actually isn't a bad idea when you stop and think about it. Larger cows mean more meat. Of course, that also means more calorie dense requirements concerning its own food, but as long as it can graze all day, in theory, it might work. So rather than having like 300 head of cattle, you can now make do with 150 because they double in size. The benefits of having to take care of a herd half that size would potentially put less pressure on farmers and along with it less strain on the surrounding environment as you need less space. Not hearing any negatives yet, are you? So that's because actually, I mean, all tender meats did was continue the next logical step of human manipulation of a species. In reality, if you think about it right now, that isn't really that far off the table as CRISPR is concerned, it could be something we could use in the future. Our food will be modified genetically, which we actually already do right now with food. The issue arose when it wasn't a targeted response and likely contained other gene manipulating traits. To accompany the increase in strength a cow would have from more muscle, it's highly likely the skeletal structure would need alteration to prevent bone breaks from everyday use. The gene that is involved in collagen production, known as COL2A1, 
which plays a massive role in skeletal development, would be affected along with the FGFR3 proteins that regulate bone growth by limiting formation of bone from cartilage. It's kind of good that it does that anyways, but osteoblasts would be released into the body to bolster and increase the density of existing bone. These alone would help the cow to increase its size as every cell is gene altered, but the problem arose later. See, when you cook meat, you denature proteins within. Any gene editing tools are destroyed and the meat is sterilized. And this is how issues are not passed along when you eat an animal, but should you not cook it enough, it can be an issue. This works for everything but prions and toxins left over by bacteria, which induces food poisoning. That's why you can't outcook food poisoning. Once it's already developed that bacteria, the toxins are now in there and they will make you sick. So when the fluke worm came into contact with a cow naturally, as this is one of their hosts, they would not be eating cooked meat. Instead, they would be consuming the blood that not only housed the gene editing tool, but the cells currently affected by this gene editing tool, which may have triggered an interesting response, a contamination event or a crossover event. It really doesn't matter what you call it. As the fluke worm consumed cells that were then broken down, it may be possible that the tool used to gene edit the cows involved the insertion of genes instead of just the mutation of them. By inserting genes into a genome, you can cause a cell to behave completely outside of the norm. And this is where I believe the fluke worm gained this ability. The gene editing tool primed to grow cows instead took that method and transferred it to the fluke worms. It may also be that the cows consume the feed and the fluke worms consume the feed, which then just, you know, straight up put the gene editing tool in their body. And some cow DNA would at some point cross over into the cells that were composing the wall of the fluke worm's digestive sac. And this would begin to hybridize these cells, inserting genes from a cow itself into the fluke worm. Seems a little odd, right? Well, not really. If you look at parasites traits, which we will hear in a moment. So over at the barn now, Jacob shows everyone his hidey hole. <laughs> Terrible phrasing that he was stockpiling his Second Amendment rights in. Raise hell, praise the hell. Heading back to the truck, they load up Jacob as he heads back down to grab some more stuff as the sheriff arrives to arrest everyone. They then go to find Jacob as he switches off the lights so that he cannot be found. The sheriff finds his stockpile like a true glowy, and then they just kind of give up trying to find him. He then waits for them to head out as he spots one of the parasites taking out an owl in the distance, which is not really good, but seriously, no shot something like that is sneaking up on an owl. I'm just saying. So at the station, Eli tries to talk to the sheriff as all these calls are coming in. People are calling about aliens in the yard as the sheriff keeps hanging up on them. And see, unless the whole town is screwing with you, that many calls would clearly show you need to take this seriously. This is like Officer Mooney and Killer Clowns from Outer Space. Like, complete negligence of your job. So over at Fletcher's house, Mrs. Fletcher is like tucking in little Fletcher, but her son pays for the sins of the father. At the office, Fletcher begins shredding everything. Milo comes in saying he's leaving the company as he can't do this. Fletcher tells him the same things he told Felix. Silence is golden. He writes him a check with a lot of money, apparently, tells him to get out of town, and that Felix actually took the same deal. He's not actually dead. So Fletcher isn't necessarily a, like, horrible dude. At least he didn't take out the vet. It just seems like maybe this should have been studied on a smaller scale prior to releasing it on all cows in the area, and that's why you have to do control studies first. Then again, Fletcher is also trying to cover it up. So I guess arrive at your own conclusion as to what you think about this guy. Milo then takes the check and says he's never coming back. Meanwhile, at Fletcher's residence, the mom hears her son yell. She goes up to check for monsters and nothing's in there. As she turns around, well, little Fletcher's being eaten by a monster. Bummer, bro. So at the station, things are starting to become apparent to the sheriff. One of his deputies starts talking about how his stomach is killing him. Literally. As he starts walking, he falls over as the creature begins emerging. Eli then warns the sheriff the parasite is coming. Jacob comes in and takes out the parasite like a Giga Chad once more. He tells the sheriff to start working for the people again rather than the company. He releases everyone and they lock and load Brides of Christ. So now Milo is leaving the town line. He looks at the check before stopping and finding a young woman bitten and drained of her blood in the road, which means these things have literally made it pretty much outside of town at this point. Uh, she made it pretty far also. He then hears skittering in the distance and runs back to his car. He then turns to spot a parasite is in there as he gets nedried. Uh-uh-uh, you didn't have the right ethics. Uh-uh-uh, wow, that was lame. So Fletcher is now driving home and seeing, well, the parasite is everywhere and it is eating anything that is moving. Pulling up to his pad, he calls out for his wife, which she doesn't answer. Walking around, he eventually finds her on the ground. Having no real response to this, he heads outside and pot shots a few of the parasites and then he goes to check out like what this creature is where he spots his son. Where then he has a massive breakdown over this, and I mean, I get it, that's a whole genetic line drawing to a close. Usually a little more hard hitting than a spouse, which implies an interesting biological response, which has nothing to do with anything, 
But it's always cool to just kind of highlight that, yeah, you probably will care more about your offspring than your spouse. So we now jump over to a tanker truck, and the creatures have begun overwhelming entire areas. Fletcher moves through a barn, hearing them all around him as one jumps onto him. Piercing his chest cavity, I think, it starts sucking him dry. That's the sort of hug you do not want. Jacob continues driving the fertilizer tanker, leaving a nice trail to attract the creatures, as apparently they enjoy the scent. I mean, I suppose they're driven to the scent, because it's where they were laid eggs in, and that's going to be the smell that they like. It's an interesting idea. Not sure how they came up with this plan. Did I miss something? No, I did not. They just didn't tell us the plan. They just started doing the plan. So now we have gotten a good look at these creatures. We can discuss their internal anatomy and why they became what they did. To refresh, I believe their genome may have had cow DNA inserted into key areas such as skeletal growth and muscular growth. This is denoted by the appearance of a vertebral column along with other bones, which would not be able to form from simply inserting a bone growth increasing gene. It would need a basis to grow from which that is where the cow DNA comes in. Cows being a vertebrate along with containing the gene editing tool in their own cells would be passed along to the fluke worm and this increased its muscular size along the same lines as well as its overall size pushed by the addition of an internal skeleton. Along with this we can assume the mouth is on the underside of this creature which is why it wraps around its victim and then bites. We never really see what it's doing but I would imagine the mouth starts sort of eating into the abdomen of a person going to the liver where they'll find it's going to find plenty of food and blood. It's likely that when it emerges from a person it has already consumed the liver entirely and has left the body to seek out food elsewhere. This process causes a person to begin bleeding internally, and this is why it's always coming out of their mouth. So their flight is a little strange though, I will say, but perhaps a circumstantial adaptation. As the bones grow into wings essentially, the fluke worm would still need to move. By maintaining its undulation as it's known, this may help to sort of flap these newly formed wings, allowing it to take flight. Though they mostly just appear to crawl, it will use its wings as gliders. Using the fertilizer, the plan is to detonate the small area as all the parasites in the immediate area begin crawling into the pipeline. They get the dynamite rigged and then set up charges. Two minutes have passed as Jacob then yells out and comes running. They realize the sheriff hasn't returned yet. As he comes running towards them, the parasites are hot on his tail. Of course, he falls and lays there as they keep firing into the parasites like, bro, get up. Hundreds begin approaching as Haley also must defend the trigger point. They then have to abandon their main plan as then they fall back to get out of there as they're being too closed in on. The sheriff then gets grabbed and pulled through a doorway as they are forced to leave him behind. Although, you know, he was morally questionable anyway, so eh, whatever. So becoming a run and gun, they trigger the concussive force detonation, destroying many of the parasites. The next day, all the news comes out that this was a genetic experiment gone wrong. Haley injured her arm, but it leaves off with the idea that potentially she was infected. Was she? Maybe. Does it matter though? Well, I don't see a Larva 2 movie, so probably not. The parasite is quite an interesting one and highlights an issue we as a species may have to face in the future. If we gene edit our food, would there be cascading consequences to other animals downstream that we may not consider? Would it have to be in a sterile environment until the gene editing tool has done its job? And how would we account for these issues? Humanity typically has always written science fiction to describe future problems or inventions, believe it or not. So this may actually be one that might be a little more poignant than it first appears. But anyhow, I want to thank you guys for watching. Uh, like I said, been getting screwed by the algorithm because it's January. It's just what happens this time of year. So if you want to leave a like or comment or both, that would be ball of you. I'll drop my Twitter, Discord, Patreon, Roanoke Tales channel link, and merch shop links in the description for all those interested. And speaking of patrons, I'd like to thank mine real quick. First, huge thank you to our astronaut, the Soviet robot. Thank you, sir. Next, I'd like to thank our astrophysicist, Desk Dancer, and Dude Man 3 Thanks, guys. And next, huge thank you to our scientist, Chad, the enjoyer of scientific explanations of B-grade horror movies, Dakota23, Florian, Lucian Dragon, Octavia Serpentia, and the last final girl on the left. And in the rest of my patrons, I appreciate y'all's support as well. Your help goes a long way towards helping out. Uh, I'm going to be moving here soon, so it's greatly appreciated. But all right, that's going to do it for me. I hope everyone enjoyed, and I'll see y'all in the next one.